Hello and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm James. And I'm Nick. And together we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. Just like you, we have questions about the world. Deceptively simple questions. So one series at a time, just as fast as our little brains will allow, we'll bring together the best and the brightest to talk about these simple questions. In this first series, we're talking about climate change. Climate change is likely to affect almost every area of our lives, like a toddler with sticky fingers. So in this third episode of the series, we'll explore how we can go about building a future that's different to the past when it comes to climate change. Um, so we, we yet again had a couple of technical issues here, Nick. There's always some sort of little gremlin popping its little head up during an interview. Uh, basically, yeah, we had Rucci dropping in and out of the conversation because of mic issues, but hopefully with the power of editing, you won't even notice. (laughs) Oh, the things we could do with editing. Oh, it's magic. So who were we talking to in this episode? We talked to a professor of public policy. Hello, my name is Diane Coyle. A professor of climate change policy. Hi everyone, my name is Laura diaz Anadon. And an architectural engineer. Hi, hello everyone, uh, I'm Ruchi Chaudhry. As usual, we began by asking... Where do you um, fit in the sort of mosaic or sort of prism of climate change research? Um, I work on uh, energy use in buildings. So what I do directly addresses uh, issues uh, that are a result of climate change. Um, I work on uh, predicting the uh, indoor environment, the conditions of the indoor environment because of the uh, nature of the the building itself. Uh, And I use that to understand what sort of retrofit might be needed or what sort of changes we might need to make to buildings to make them more sustainable, more energy efficient, what sort of technologies that need to go in. Uh, to make buildings more comfortable as well as uh, uh, environmental friendly. And Laura? Yes, uh, I work on climate change mitigation, uh, trying to understand what governments across the world can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, And I do this not just by looking at the impact of different policies or different efforts on reducing emissions, but also by looking at the impacts of some of these uh, climate change mitigation options on competitiveness and on distributional impacts. Let's go to Diane. Diane. My um, work is kind of big picture and in particular how do you get policymakers to think about doing things very differently and how do they need to coordinate the very big changes in the behaviour of businesses and, and people that we're going to need to tackle climate change. And so we look at questions, me and my colleagues in the Bennett Institute, We look at questions like, how can you measure better the um, effects of um, economic activities on the natural environment? How do you bring the environment into the economy in the way that it hasn't been for as long as we've been using GDP to measure progress? How do you think about what kind of information companies ought to be using or um, the government when it's thinking about investing in infrastructure? And... um, the, 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 you know, the theory of change, I suppose, there is that if people are not measuring the effects of economic activity on the environment and nature, then they won't do anything about the harms that are being caused. So we've got to get that straight. I'm going to start us off by asking um, about a mental image of what a sustainable future could look like. So we'd like to develop such an image. Can we start by outlining some of the day-to-day challenges right now that we need to overcome? Ruchi, I'll start with you, but then the rest of you feel free just to um, uh, you know, continue after Ruchi's finished. So I wish I could say that our challenge is uh, uh, technological or uh, in a uh, question of scale, like getting improving current uh, building stock, etc., But I think the bigger challenge we face at the moment is political and institutional in terms of the uh, willingness of uh, governments to work internationally with one another. So I think these these currently are the big uh, issues uh, that uh, we need to be worried about. And Laura, what do you, you know, to try and give us a sort of develop a mental image of what the sustainable future could look like, what about sort of 
reliance on fossil fuels and transportation? What do we um, need to think about? To address climate change and to uh, meet the goals laid out by the Paris Agreement, which uh, involves stabilizing uh, global average temperatures to two degrees, we would need to uh, have a rapid and profound near-term decarbonization of energy supply. And this involves having uh, a decarbonized uh, electricity grid, uh, this will also involve electrifying with this decarbonized electricity, a lot of the uh, certainly personal transport. Um, we will also need to improve efficiency of buildings. And, and I'm very glad we have Ruchi here with us to tell us a lot more about this. Absolutely. Because, we, I mean, buildings is something that we consume no matter where we are, whether we are at home or at workplace or anywhere, in the sense that they are significant consumers of energy. And as a result, they uh, they have a, a direct impact on climate change, but they are also very directly affected by climate change. So they play an important role. Uh, buildings are kind of entities that stay and stick for a long time, uh, unlike transport. So, you know, transport uh, has a faster turnaround, whereas, you know, uh, we still occupy buildings that are, you know, 100 and more than 100 years old. But we, we managed to adapt using technology and uh, uh, using changes in lifestyle. We managed to adapt according to the current time. I think the interesting thing going in the future with respect to climate change is going to be about resilience because it's it's then going to be a game of, you know, which, part, which of the building stock is able to withstand all the uh, effects of the climate change. So that's going to, resilience is going to play a very big role with respect to built environment. Um, because, uh, you know, the whole of our economy contributes to climate change, uh, buildings, industry, uh, transport uh, and energy, um, as well as agriculture, will need to dramatically change in a relatively short time frame. And I agree with Ruchi's point about how this will need really significant institutional changes. Diane, would you like to pick up there on the sort of political and institutional changes required or the challenges needed? Well, as, uh, as Laura and Ruchi have already set out, um, we're talking about changes across a really wide range of activities. So we've heard about um, uh, buildings, energy, transport, agriculture and the food that we eat. But actually, any of the material products that we, that we use, that we purchase, we need to rethink what they're made of, where they come from, um, how long they last, how they get recycled. And so the challenge is really, we need the new technologies in areas like energy or, or carbon sequestration. Um, we need the uh, behavior changes across a whole range of things that we do day to day. And these all need to be coordinated. So it sounds quite daunting and, you know, in a sense, getting all of these things joined up is quite a daunting task. It's a really big institutional challenge. But on the other hand, there are also lots of things that individuals can do to start to change. So I wouldn't want anybody to get discouraged about it. I think there are lots of things that choices that we make ourselves in everyday life and that in itself changes the, um, the, the political dynamics of it. So the more people express um, their concern about the issues, but also change what they purchase, change how they travel, change um, how they insulate their buildings and so on, then the more that changes the political feasibility of getting those big scale institutional and political changes. And I, I would uh, like to add on to what Diane just mentioned, that I, I think it's really important and those sort of uh, personal decisions can accelerate or, or propel political action. But I also think it's important to, to talk about how we need to do all of these things at the, at the same time. Uh, in many cases, consumers, investors don't really have the information. And again, this goes back to the importance of a lot of the work that Diane is doing on trying to understand and, and measure things. But often we don't really know as consumers or investors what uh, products are more sustainable than others. So we really do need uh, uh, this coordination effort that enables some of these decisions to, to move us in this more sustainable direction. Is there anywhere at the moment where we can find out that sort of information, how we as consumers and individuals can, can find information to make better, more sustainable choices? There is, um, there is a lot of information available, um, but you sort of have to know how to look for it. And one of the things that 
um, the government could do would be to make this easier for people. Um, there are, for example, apps that you can download that tell you um, you, you scan the codes, the barcodes on the food that you're buying, and it can tell you about um, the nutritional content, but also some, some of them tell you about um, provenance and sourcing. Um, but it would, be, it would be good to have a really um, authoritative, uh, straightforward guideline, some kind of traffic light system that um, people are very, find very familiar to understand. And I think similarly for the investor community, there isn't a standard, transparent and credible set of, you know, I don't know, uh, indices or guidelines about what businesses are taking climate mitigation and adaptation more seriously. There's been a very important work done in the task force on climate related financial disclosures, but that's still uh, not providing us as much information as we need about uh, what the impacts are. Uh, of of those uh, companies, so uh, so I think there is a lot that can be done from governments and 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 central banks to to help these decisions, and the appetite for this is increasing. One of the encouraging things is seeing banks like this, like the um, Bank of England and financial regulators, starting to understand that actually climate change is going to bring about really significant financial and economic risk, and the the banks and the other financial businesses that they regulate need to start taking this into account. Okay. So we started by asking them to construct for us a mental image of what a sustainable future might look like. And they quietly sidestepped the question. Like a crab which has been caught shoplifting. Like a granny in a gale. Or like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing around a badly placed house plant. (laughs) Sorry, clearly I've been watching too much classic cinema during lockdown. So maybe (laughs) it is harder to predict the future than we thought. I guess so. I mean, they did make clear that it's not just a question of technology and what is technically possible. It's also that there's a political challenge. It all boils down to people. And as we know from last time, people can be tricky, especially if they're forced to behave in certain ways because of the institutions they're part of. But what we did learn is that to reach a sustainable future, so many industries will need to change and quickly change. Buildings, energy, transport and agriculture, basically all the material products we will buy need to be reconsidered. What are they made of? Where do they come from? And how are they made? Can they be recycled? And all of this requires new technologies and new behaviours, perhaps supported by policy. I must say this sounds pretty discouraging, but they did remind us that individual actions do make a difference and will add up, resulting in larger scale changes. So the message from our guests here is similar to what we heard in the last episode. Getting informed is an important first step, even if the information isn't always easy to find. Thinking about the the technology and the innovation that we've discussed already, how is innovation going to help us to resolve some of the issues that we've just mentioned about buildings? Um, and essentially, is it going to exasperate climate change or sort of build some form of resilience? Yes. So, so um, innovation is, of course, a very uh, big word. And here, uh, uh, what we know is that a lot of the technologies that are already in most places or in many places cost competitive uh, where technologies such as you know solar panels, wind turbines, onshore and offshore uh, batteries, solid state lighting, and all of these technologies that are now uh, again very uh, you know in many cases uh, uh, cost competitive, uh, they were uh, developed as a result of of government policies around the world uh, from a, in in terms of a technology push in, in your public funding for research and development and and uh, early commercialization as well of as market pull so uh, you know the, when we say oh we need to decarbonize uh, the electricity sector well it's becoming possible because since the you know 80s and 90s uh, governments around the world have invested in these technologies um, of course the pace at which uh, these technologies have been deployed uh, it's not sufficient and we need to accelerate this and we will also need additional technologies to get us eventually to net zero, which is the only way to stabilize the climate. Uh, the innovation we've had to date is, you know, uh, one of the bright spots uh, in terms of uh, our ability to meet the climate challenge. The cost reductions in all of these technologies were things that, you know, few if uh, or, or, or nobody really predicted. Um, and uh, but we will need more uh, and we uh, more n- new technologies and we will also need 
uh, a faster uh, diffusion of these technologies. Um, but again, it's a piece of the component. Uh, technology by itself is not going to get us out. And certainly even technology without additional government support, uh, frameworks and guidance is not going to even deliver on what it could. I agree with Laura about the need for the new technologies, but as well as inventing them, they have to uh, have people invest in them. And I think, you know, we start out this conversation by talking about challenges. And one of the challenges in the immediate term is that, you know, we've got the um, pandemic, which is going to hit economies and we will see uh, government finances taking a, a very big hit from what's been happening this year. And so part of the case that needs to be made is that investing these technologies in new energy systems and so on is a really good investment to make at the moment when governments need to fix their budgets and provide jobs for people. So it can be a source of providing skilled jobs, but also as, as some of my colleagues, Matthew Agawala and Dimitri Zengelis have shown in their work, it actually has a, a really high social return. You get a financial return as an investor and then you get all the additional benefits of um, limiting or averting what might be happening to the climate. Yeah, I mean, we've also done some work in this space at the Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance Synergy. And what we've been trying to look at is the extent to which uh, fi- funding uh, from a government perspective, but also a private sector perspective, some of the deployment of these you know, relatively novel technologies uh, can contribute to increase domestic and innovative capacity, increase well-being of uh, the uh, people surrounding the areas where some of this infrastructure and technology po- uh, projects are deployed. And also in some cases, it can lead to a you know, competitive advantage in, of a domestic industry. Um, and I think some of the things that we've been learning recently is that while it might be hard for you know, the UK or another country to say, well, if we invest more on this technology from a public or private perspective, will be the world leaders exporting the whole supply chain of that technology. We're now beginning to understand that depending on your uh, domestic know-how and the complexity and characteristics of that technology, uh, you know, smart investments and smart policies might allow uh, the case for this short-term uh, competitiveness and economic benefit to be made. So I completely agree with the, the notion that uh, we're you know, now developing across the university and of course beyond evidence that that shows that these are actually smart investments, not just because they, uh, you know, they allow us to reduce the, you know, climate change damages uh, or, you know, the air pollution, you know, health impacts, which are really substantial or even, you know, addressing ecosystem issues, but also because they they can position, you know, countries to capture what is, you know, already becoming one of the you know uh, major uh, growing uh, uh, markets for trade internationally. If I can um, chip in again, th- so that's a really important point about the ability of, of a country like the UK to um, you know develop new industries and export. But the point Laura mentioned about well-being is also really important, and we shouldn't forget about the much harder to measure benefits to people when they live in um, a place that has clean air, when they have access to green space, when um, biodiversity is not being um, catastrophically damaged the way it is at the moment. And that's not just um, a fuzzy feeling of, um, you know, you feel you feel a bit better about things. It's actually a direct health impact and mental health impact that has been reported you know, quite substantively by a number of colleagues. Yeah, yeah, no, I I completely agree. I think those are really, really important too. Um, I was just trying to say that, you know, in the area in which I've I've worked on, I guess, you know, the most, we're seeing that the case can be made, but, uh, you know, of course, understanding um, the extent to which, you know, people's, you know, happiness and uh, and, and life, quality of life uh, is improved by not having a particular forest, you know, be destroyed or, or ecosystem. Uh, or, or, or even, you know, walking to work every day or, or, or you know, biking. Um, it's also something that, that can really help, uh, you know, build support, even though, you know, maybe for some of these short term investments in, in terms of something like the green recovery, uh, it might be harder to uh, make that case, although I, I do think it's really worthwhile. And can I ask here, if I were to jump in, when thinking about well-being or positive social outcomes, 
do these as sort of measures speak to policymakers or is it really only about finance or infrastructure or or other more kind of uh, directly tangible economic metrics which matter you have to work a bit to make them speak to policymakers which we are ab- about to publish a, a report doing exactly this but you can point to quite direct impacts one example would be the link between vulnerability to coronavirus and air quality via um, asthma or respiratory diseases. And so that's a very direct thing that speaks to the immediate policy agenda. But your question is why we spend so much time trying to put numbers on these things, because the role of, um, of numbers and monetary measures in policy has been incredibly influential. And we all know that gets translated into what's happened to GDP quarter to quarter. It's important, it's linked to whether people have jobs and whether their incomes are going up, but it isn't everything. And we've been putting a zero on all kinds of things that are very uh, important and that will actually, in the long term, destroy our capacity to have good lives in a sound economy if we don't do something about it now. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more. (laughs) It's... uh... Uh, it's really essential. And even some of the most recent estimates of, you know, taking the two examples that I am mentioned, looking at um, uh, the impact of, of climate on health through uh, air pollution. Um, and, you know, then, you know, even if one tries to put, uh, you know, uh, pound figures on, on ecosystem services, even just those two things, uh, those two, uh, you know, co-benefits, I guess, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions are enough to compensate for some of the short-term policy costs of putting in place some of the um, some of the subsidies or regulations or incentives to incentivize some of this faster diffusion of the technologies. So I think it's really important to include these uh, these co-benefits. Some of them are easier to quantify or at least quantifiable to some extent, uh, and some others, that, as uh, Diane was saying, are, are hard to quantify. But we still need to better understand it. Because yeah, our you know the, our world could be very different in the next you know twenty years if we don't. Yeah, I think it's also impo- important to uh, remember when we quantify because we've been trying to sort of look at different technologies, implement them. We've been successful partially uh, in some areas and less successful in others. Uh, we also I think the key thing is to acknowledge also the uh, variable impact of technologies across demographics and across populations. Uh, because we're not going to have one solution that's going to work for everyone. So this whole uh, understanding, this whole basket of technologies or options that are available for us, pushing uh, others uh, in in terms of innovation and and then understanding that an equal diffusion may, is not going to work and understanding what causes those variations becomes important. Also, I think another thing is that in it's it's the kind of the climate change is the kind of problem we have that doesn't understand boundaries. So we have to work collectively across the board. We have to uh, a, a, we have to work internationally, and we have to work across uh, nations in understanding uh, what lives and livelihoods means in different contexts and what it asks for. So that's a very important point, of course, and international coordination is is difficult um, because the, it, it, the, a lot of the countries that um, are going to bear the cost of damages of climate change are not in the position to um, bear the cost of the innovation and, and investment that's needed. So there's a, a, a question of transfers there, and that has obviously made it difficult to get international agreement in, in the past. I think it will turn out, and again, this is work that one of my colleagues has done, Matthew Argawala, that actually some of the rich countries themselves are going to experience quite a lot of damage from climate change and biodiversity. The, um, you know, we've seen the, some of the quite dramatic impacts in the United States of, of wildfires, but the effects of the climate on um, agriculture across the Midwest, but agricultural productivity in any rich country is, if biodiversity continues to be depleted in the way it has. That's, um, that's going to change the incentives, I think, over time. So... I'm slightly optimistic that this international coordination will get a little bit easier when the damages become more evident. But of course, the fear is that when the damage becomes more evident like that, we've left it really too late to um, 
make solutions uh, easy and effective. Are the sort of damages going to be balanced out across the nations, if you will? Because you just said that some um, less well-off nations will bear more of the costs. So how is that going to even itself out? Well, the fear is that it won't even itself out. A lot of the damage does seem likely to fall on low-income countries, who are the ones that have not contributed um, very much at all because they are low-income countries to what's been happening to the climate. And the countries that have been doing the damage... Um, people have expected to be the ones suffering the least um, damaging consequences from climate change. The hypothesis I'm putting forward is that that's not going to carry on being the case and that there will be increasing damage from climate change across all the rich countries. And so the incentives for international cooperation and transfers to take action may therefore improve over time. Yeah, and I think we, we already have some examples. Of course, we need much more, as, as Diane is uh, indicating, but we do have some examples of programs trying to accelerate and you know, actually introduce some of these renewable energy technologies in countries that uh, where you know there's a lot of technology risk, a lot of country risk, there you know uh, policy regulatory risk. So one one um, research project we've done was to analyze some of the investments that the German the German Development Bank has done to incentivize. Uh, renewable energy deployment in Uganda. And what we were seeing is that small kind of uh, uh, top ups of feed in tariffs uh, over uh, a few years led to the cost of capital going down, a lot of you know, hydropower and, uh, and, and solar power deployment. And we also saw that there were uh, local uh, benefits in terms of you not know, just expertise created on the ground, but also reduced uh, outages, which increased the productivity. So I think we have some you know, there's, of course, uh, you know, examples by um, the UK government and other international, um, uh, you know, multilateral um, agencies. Uh, but I agree. I think we, 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 we should expect uh, more of this because the industrialized countries alone uh, are not going to be able to, uh, you know, get to like, the world to net zero. We need everybody to do it. And, uh, and, um, and, the, and the developing countries don't have oh, not just are not just uh, bearing uh, some of the largest ba- burden, they also have the lowest capacity to put in place the adaptation and mitigation strategies because of institutional reasons and because of resource reasons. Okay, let's do a little catch up here. Technology and innovation. Yes, there are lots of technologies out there that can help. The problem is accelerating the pace of deployment, how quickly we can actually begin to use these technologies. So inventing a useful technology is one thing, but getting investment for it so that other people can make use of it, that's another thing entirely. And that's before COVID caused all sorts of financial havoc. That being said, sounds like there are lots of benefits to investing in greener technologies that aren't about financial gains. For example, health gains, both mental and physical health. Absolutely. But as Ruchi pointed out, technologies impact different populations in different ways. They don't even get used in the same way by different people and in different places. Another instance where there's no silver bullet. When it comes to silver bullets, we are, I fear, becoming broken records here. Also, what's the metaphor? Is climate change a werewolf? How come it sounds fancy to say there's no silver bullet, but it doesn't sound fancy to say climate change isn't a werewolf? Well, climate change is something out of nightmares, right? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, I thought we worked out climate change was a toddler, not a werewolf. Anyway, (laughs) we're not going to find a single technology that magically (laughs) solves all of our problems. Even worse, climate change doesn't respect political or cultural boundaries. So we really need to think and act on a global scale. Okay then, so what speaks to policymakers? What makes them listen? Numbers? Well, Diane did tell us that numbers do speak to policymakers to some extent. But don't forget, we learned back in episode two that numbers don't always help us as individuals to really understand what's going on. Maybe they're good for big picture thinking, but don't work so well on the scale of making individual decisions. And Diane also reminded us that numbers don't always capture everything that's important. So, for example, GDP, gross domestic product, is one way of estimating how we're doing as a country. But this misses all sorts of factors we'd probably agree are super important, like health and happiness. That being said, the variable impact of technologies across different populations is one of the things that gets in the way of policymakers taking action, though. Lots of the countries that will bear the costs of climate change are not in a good position to finance the innovation needed to stop or mitigate it. 
This has made it especially hard to get international agreements together. Yes, true. But Diane pointed out that wealthy countries will also experience some pretty dramatic consequences of climate change. Just think about the wildfires on the west coast of the US, for example. So hopefully wealthier nations will also feel some incentives to take action. Bottom line is, though, everything needs to be working towards reaching net zero which is making sure the amount of greenhouse gases we produce is not more than the amount we remove from the atmosphere. Thankfully, there's some evidence that countries are willing to do this. Uh, Think of the 2015 Paris Agreement, which is a good start. And as we discussed last time, hopefully COP26 can build on this. But what about the elephant in the room? Oh, you mean Doris over here? (laughs) No, not Doris. Of course, COVID-19. How will COVID impact all of these plans? What sort of questions has COVID-19 raised about the state of our sort of our, our economy and what we want it to be going forward? This has been um, the most substantial shock to the global economy, to every country's economy uh, in, in living memory and, and even longer. And many economists, including me, are really quite concerned about what's going to happen over the next um six months or a year or 18 months because the the impact on on people's jobs and businesses closing seems very profound and so that means that there'll be a lot of pressure on governments to fix things short term and try to get people back into jobs and the economy growing no matter what and that means that the the making the point about the economic benefits of investing for a greener future are really important. But on the other, the other hand, there's a lot of evidence from polling and just you know conversations that one has with people suggesting this idea of a future that's not like the past has really taken hold. And I think there'll be a great appetite for um, more uh, equality, for a fairer economy, but also for a greener economy where things other than short-term profit matter and the focus will actually be I think quite intense on corporate behavior ever since the financial crisis in 2008-9 the level of public trust in big business has been very low and many big businesses are starting to um, respond to that they're doing it by looking at um, environmental and social goals trying to formalize the measures that they use in their corporate accounting. This has a long way to go, and I think a lot of it is still only lip service. But pandemics like this and the kind of economic crisis that um, will ensue, events on that scale always lead, I think, to fundamental changes, fundamental turning points. And the optimistic view of this is that the public appetite for a more sustainable, a fairer, a greener economy will be so large that Anybody who can do something about it, businesses, governments, central banks, will start to do something about it. And of course, you know, part of the conversation that we're all having as researchers, policy is encouraging that kind of thinking and um, uh, suggesting ways to to bring it about through particular measures or or, or policies. Yeah, I, th- I think this is, uh, you know, a. Uh... A difficult time and that is creating a lot of you know constraints on one hand but it also provides an opportunity for the reasons that Diane discussed to do things differently I think what this uh, responding to this uh, you know unprecedented crisis will require not just uh, increased coordination across different government entities because you know transport and jobs and environment and health you know all of these things are connected well-being uh, but also it will require uh, more nimble, uh, you know, decision makers, governments, not just coordinating, but also being able to adapt to, you know, new information, new knowledge, uh, you know, be more experimental. Again, we have, you know, we have some evidence about uh, what the impacts of those policies has been in the past. Uh, but I think we're facing different world and, and government policymakers will need to be adaptive and more, you know, if perhaps even more important, uh, governments will need to be more inclusive. We'll need to engage the public more, not just in terms of trying to elicit or or, or get support, but also trying to understand uh, what are the impacts of uh, you know of, of some of the policies or proposals on people on the ground in different places. I think this is 
something that Ruchi had mentioned at the beginning that you know a lot of the impacts are very location specific and I do think that this idea of a just uh, an inclusive transition is one that has implications for how governments uh, both uh, national uh, you know and, and local should go about this and and one example of what's uh, being done uh, in this area is that for example the uh, combined authority of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough has created uh, uh, an independent committee on climate change, partly to try to understand, uh, you know, how to get to net zero by 2050, but also what, you know, how to involve, uh, you know, citizens in the area to better understand um, how to uh, do this in an inclusive and uh, fair way. So we were talking about building off the COVID-19 and the lessons learned. So sort of prior to this pandemic, we were thinking 2020 was set to be a big year for climate change. So what will be the sort of legacy of 2020 um, when it comes to climate change? Uh, air travel, the big, big change it's going to have on air travel in the future and uh, work uh, uh, habits in the future. That's going to be huge. So we've, we've learned to live in uh, many different ways and to work in many different ways. And I think that's going to have a real lasting impact. And it's also going to affect how, uh, what influence certain technologies have on buildings. So I, I can give you a very, very simple example that where in the past, a more uh, sophisticated control of heating may not have been very useful in a office building because you know it starts off on and off. If there's a certain timer, there's a certain expectation of a crowd coming in and a crowd going out. That actually now, may begin to make a lot of sense. It's a simple investment, but it enables you to tailor the environment of the building to accommodate few people, 25% people, 50% people, 80% or 100%. So you see the kind of technologies that may then suddenly look appealing um, uh, changes. And it, you know a very broad general uh, lesson that we are learning out of the pandemic is that uh, we are safe when everyone is safe. And I think that equally applies to climate change as well. It's a really interesting question. I'm not sure um, how much change in patterns of work and travel I think there will be longer term. I'm sure Ruchi's right to say there'll, there'll certainly be some. But there are other implications too. If we're all going to be working from home much more, then we'll all be um, through the winter wanting to heat our houses much more and Exactly. the incentive to get insulation but also yeah. there are questions about who's going to pay for that and so i think there are some issues to be resolved before we know what the final patterns are going to be yeah so i, I and that's something that um, so there are people already starting to think about uh, not just ventilation standards in buildings but how we now address this uh, basket of technology measures that need to be diffused into our built environment where we were only thinking solely of non-domestic versus residential now we have to think about them in an integrated manner from an operational point of view because a lot of the uh, workspace consumption has shifted to the domestic sphere um so one this is a, a, of course a very important conversation and and the question of what will what changes in uh, where we work or how we travel um uh, uh, become more sustained or not is is a, a crucial one, and it's great to hear that uh, you know Ruti and our colleagues in architecture are working on this topic. Um, uh, but I did want to put this in context of the uh, large scale changes that we were talking about uh, at the beginning. And you know, in spite of this uh, huge you know crisis being you know unprecedented <laughs> and massive, uh, when we think about the impact it has had on greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now, some of the best estimates that have come out so far suggest that the impact on emissions reductions over the counterfactual of what would have happened uh, otherwise based on, you know, the previous years and, and you know, the, the ongoing policies or the expected policies was that, uh, you know, the decrease in emissions was only around 8%. Uh, so if we think about the fact that not all of these, you know, decreases will uh, stay constant, this, I think, further underlies or underlines the 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 scale of the challenge that we're facing, because even with all of these massive changes, you know, we've only come uh, cut down emissions um, by, you know, around 8%. So I, I think this brings us back to where we started, right, of, uh, you know, we need a, 
a, a strategy that involves businesses, that imp involves more aggressive and, and more coordinated actions by governments and also engagement with citizens and by citizens uh, uh, to make this possible. Because again, we just see the massive scale of what we're going through uh, and that hasn't changed so much our emissions. So circling back to what we talked about at the start, where we tried to begin to paint a mental image of what a sustainable future might look like, and we started with the challenges that face us now. Can you tell us what everyday life might look like for individuals in a more sustainable future? <laughs> yeah, easy question. <laughs> Just predict the future, no problem. Can I start by saying that we're really bad at predicting the future, yeah, both in terms of, <laughs> we, we know from a, a lot of research of, you know, uh, you know, in our group, but also beyond that our ability to predict, you know, both technology improvements, diffusion of technologies, you know, uh, oil prices, resources is, is really, really bad. Um, I, um, I think, it, you know, and we also, when we talk about predicting the future, I think it makes a difference whether we're talking about 2030, 2050, or 2100. Uh, of course, it gets increasingly difficult <laughs> to 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 visualize this. But I, you know, I would hope that if we, if countries around the world take this opportunity or, or this challenge <laughs> seriously, hopefully in you know 10 years or you know 20 years, we'll see more coordinated aggressive policy action. We will see faster diffusion of some of the technologies we already have. We will see changes in industry and, you know, shipping and aviation, which are some of these hard to, you know, decarbonize sectors where it's harder to kind of envision what they might look like. Uh, and we'll also have more of this information that we're talking about that will hopefully enable these uh, purchases by consumers and investments uh, in financial markets. I, I also think we're beginning to see more evidence that uh, corporations are beginning to take into account not just climate risks, but also the possible uh, benefits of being um, first movers in this space. I'm, I'm hoping, I, I'm not sure if it's a prediction, it's certainly a, a, a hope uh, that we'll get into a little bit of a virtuous circle. I agree with Laura that it's very hard for us to make predictions that far into the future if you're talking about 100 years. But working on the built environment, we know that we still occupy buildings that are more than 100 years old. What we do with it depends a lot on how adept we become at using technologies. And if we push it to use technologies in a manner that's beneficial, that's sustainable, then Sure, we are looking at a future where we would be able to use our buildings far more sustainably than we currently do. And uh, this is exactly what the example of urban integrated agriculture or uh, growing food in urban environments uh, indicates, that uh, you could uh, have synergistically multiple functions within uh, built environments and you could use them to co-benefit one another. I can I can definitely see that we would be bu using buildings in manners that we cannot even imagine at the moment and we would be using them on the fly with, uh, you know, functions changing. We'll jump to Diane. Diane, so how will the sort of distribution of wealth, what will that look like in, you know, 20, 30, 50 years? I, I'm going to predict that the distribution of wealth will be more equal than it is now. And I think the uncertainty is about how that comes about. Because the situation we have now in terms of financial wealth, um, uh, wealth in terms of access to nature or to um, social connections, all of these are incredibly unevenly distributed in an unsustainable way. And either governments and businesses will respond to that and change the way that the system is structured to deliver fairer outcomes, or we will have a period of incredible political upheaval and even conflict as we've had at certain times in the past. And um, the, the choice we have is not where do we get to, but how do we get there? After saying they were all really bad at making predictions, that was actually quite a prediction from Diane there at the end. Absolutely. I guess it's both comforting and unsettling that we're looking at trying to create a future which isn't like the past. Not that we can imagine exactly what that might look like. Exactly. Something as, as seemingly simple as how we live and work and use our buildings could look totally different in a not too distant future. And something as seemingly huge and unchangeable as how wealth is distributed could change beyond all recognition, perhaps becoming more fair and more equal. 
Well, it seems like instead of painting a picture of what the future might look like, they filled our heads with more questions and fuzzy areas. The more we learn, the less we actually know. And the less we know, the more podcast episodes we need. Well, I can't wait to see what the future looks like. Always so impatient. So who will be talking to us next time? And what about? In the next episode, we'll talk with Helen Ann Curry. Hello, I'm Helen Ann Curry. Giles Oldroyd. Hello, I'm Giles Oldroyd. And Shailaja Fennell. Good morning, I'm Shailaja Fennell. About how to feed the world sustainably. Looking forward to it. In the meantime, I'm going to go sort out Doris over here. She's looking rather cramped. Yeah, so in the meantime, please like and subscribe to Mind Over Chatter on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a review. And don't forget to tell your friends, family, neighbours, people you meet on the street, people you drive past in the car. Just tell everyone. A huge thanks once again to our guests, Diane Coyle, Laura Diaz-Anadon and Ruchi Chowdhury. And as ever, to Naomi Clements Road for production and general lurking. Music was by Carlo Ladd and artwork by Alex Sadler.